Well, this uh, month we're taking a brief break from our Believe series on learning how to think, live, and actually become more like Jesus to focus on the Advent and Christmas seasons in a series that I'm calling Believe in the Miracle of Christmas. Last week we had an opportunity to look at the extraordinary way in which Jesus' birth fulfilled biblical prophecies that we find in the Old Testament. This weekend we're turning our attention to the topic of miracles. Now miracles permeate the pages of Scripture. In the Old Testament, the greatest miracle is no doubt the miracle of creation. While we find other miracles all throughout the Hebrew Bible, uh, the the miracles tend to cluster in the Old Testament in two places, uh, around the time of the Exodus and, and the receiving of the Ten Commandments, settling into the Promised Land on the one hand, and in the stories of Elijah and Elisha. In the New Testament, Miracles play such a key role in Jesus' ministry that his enemies and his critics would acknowledge him uh, as a miracle worker. It's interesting that historians, uh, looking back on Jesus' life, even people that are skeptical about miracles and so on, uh, believe Jesus really was a miracle worker because uh, his enemies and his critics and so on would say, yeah, he did these miracles, but he didn't really do them in God's power. He did them uh, as, uh, as an agent of Satan or whatever. Uh, Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the great miracle that confirmed Jesus' identity as the Son of God and, and really brought the church and the New Testament into being. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there would be no church. There would be no New Testament. So we shouldn't be surprised that miracles accompany Jesus' arrival as a baby in Bethlehem. What kind of miracles? Well, angels uh, appear to Mary. Angel appears to Joseph and and to others. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled that a virgin would conceive and have a son who would be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Angels announce Jesus' birth to shepherds, and God's glory fills the skies. A star, an extraordinary star, leads wise men from the east to look for a newborn king. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Most astonishing of all is the amazing miracle of the incarnation, the word made flesh, the fact that God actually took on human nature. Not only was he with us, but he came as one of us. In other words, the the birth of Jesus is a miracle story. Birth of Jesus is a miracle story. But can people today really believe in miracles? I mean, can people today believe that any of this stuff that I was just talking about actually happened? When his excellent book, Miracles, author Eric Metaxas uh, actually quotes a 2013 article from the New Yorker in which Adam Gopnik it really uh, expresses what a lot of people think. He confidently dismisses miracles. He says, we know that in the billions of years of the universe's existence, there is no evidence of a single miraculous intercession with the laws of nature. That's what he claims in this article. Now let me just stop there. Let's do a reality check. Really? We know that? That in the billions of years, there is no evidence of even a single miracle? Is is that something Gopnik can really state with, with that kind of confidence? Or is he simply asserting it? Is he simply assuming it and thinking that we should buy it just because he, he does. Um, if, if that is what Gopnik's doing, he wouldn't be the first to do that. Scottish philosopher David Hume served up the classic argument against miracles back in 1748. Now, 1748 was an extraordinary period of time because back then everybody thought they knew everything, just like we do now. But... But he wrote a book, David Hume wrote a book uh, called Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And in this book he wrote, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience 
can possibly be imagined. Now that's kind of an old school way of saying things, and in a sense that kind of sounds like an argument, but I printed it up there so you could look at it because if you actually study what he's saying, that's not an argument at all. He is just assuming miracles don't happen, and he is simply asserting that miracles don't happen. Um, what about well-supported eyewitness accounts of miracles? And actually, Hume was asked this question. What about all these people that experience miracles? What about biblical miracles and so on? Well, Hume's answer to that was, he said that only ignorant and barbarous nations affirm miracles. A guy named Craig Keener, who uh, has written an extraordinary a two-volume book on, on miracles. It's like the most incredible book on, on miracles anywhere, probably ever written. He noted in a lecture that if somebody said that today, that only ignorant and barbarous people believed in miracles, we would call him an ethnocentric bigot, which, as a matter of fact, David Hume was. He was an anti-Semitic, uh, and he was racist, and he kind of felt like, you know what, if those people believe it, that just goes to prove it couldn't really happen. Really, really nasty stuff. Hume's, I'll call it his humongous mistake, uh, is one that a lot of people make, and that is assuming that people in the past didn't know how the world works. I just want to let that soak in for a second. Because this is a widespread belief. And almost every generation has felt this way. That until we've come along, nobody else ever understood anything. His mistake is, is people in the past didn't know the way the world worked. That folks were in the dark until now. And I, and I want to call that attitude out. And I want to call it for what it is. That is condescending nonsense. Absolutely condescending nonsense. To believe that people were gullible simply because they lived in the past. In fact, and I find this incredibly ironic, if you believe that, you might be demonstrating a peculiar form of gullibility and arrogance that's unique to people living in our time here in the postmodern world. Something that, that uh, Owen Bar Barfield referred to as chronological snobbery, the idea that something is wrong simply because it's past. The Bible doesn't record the virgin birth because its authors were gullible and ignorant. Uh, Matthew writes about the virgin birth. Educated person, you can tell from the Greek that he uses. Luke is a physician. He knows where babies come from. He is not a gullible guy. Um, they, both of them write about the virgin birth because they knew, as we do, that that's extraordinary. And they knew that doesn't fit the way the world works most of the time. There's only one explanation for it. It has to be miraculous. When Hume uh, asserts that miracles don't happen, he does so basically because he's a proponent of a philosophy called naturalism. He was dogmatically opposed to believing in miracles, and so he didn't believe in them. He doesn't, again, doesn't offer an argument. He just asserts that his position is true and wants us to go along with it. And it's this kind of careless thinking that prompted G.K. Chesterton to write in his book, Orthodoxy. I love this quote. This is so awesome. Somehow or other, Chesterton writes, an extraordinary idea has arisen that disbelievers in miracle consider them coldly and fairly, while believers in miracles accept them only in connection with dogma. The fact is quite the other way. Believers in miracles accept them, rightly or wrongly, because of the evidence for them. The disbelievers in miracles deny them, rightly or wrongly, because they have a doctrine 
against them. Does that make sense? It's interesting. It's ironic that when it comes to miracles, believers often take a a more open-minded, evidence-based approach than skeptics who just have an a priori prejudice against them and deny them as a matter of dogma. So, if you're open enough, open-minded enough to consider the possibility, then uh, the question remains: Why? Why does God do miracles? Why would God do miracles? Last Easter, I proposed a, a thought experiment, and I, I'd like to kind of revisit it because I think it, it could be very helpful here. Let's imagine that you were God. I know it's a stretch. But let's just imagine that you were God and you wanted to communicate your existence. And you wanted to communicate your message. And you wanted to communicate your love in a way that would speak to people in all times and all ages, all places, to people in all cultures, to people no matter what age they were and no matter what their religious background. Suppose you were God and you wanted to communicate your existence, your love, and your message to everybody everywhere. How would you do that? How would you do that so that everyone everywhere could get it? Well, let me just say right at the outset, you're not going to do it through science because science is kind of a late thing wouldn't speak to anybody, wouldn't speak to people that were never raised, who don't have the education, who lived prior to the development of modern Western science and so on. Seems to me, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, seems to me that you would want to speak in history, first of all, so that there could be actual evidence that you had spoken. The people could investigate it. You would want to speak in the language of human experience so that people could relate to it. And you would speak in a way that would make it clear that the message could come only from God. Couldn't possibly come from another source. In other words, you would speak in a way that would be extraordinary. And, at least for people, with an open mind, without prejudice or agenda, you would speak in a way that's so extraordinary that it would not be easily dismissible. You would have to work hard to dismiss the evidence. And that's where miracles come in. That's where miracles come in. Miracles are signs that are meant to get our attention and to point us to God. Because this is exactly what God chose to do in speaking to us. Last week we looked at prophecy and we looked at the the birth of Christ and and we read Isaiah chapter 7 verse 4 that says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And what's the sign? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. That's the kind of sign that isn't going to happen every day. It's going to be extraordinary, and if it happens, it could only happen because God did it. This is why the Bible often refers to miracles as signs and wonders. As John's gospel draws to a close, uh, in chapter uh, 20, verse 30, we read these words, Jesus performed many other signs. This is John's word for miracles. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by by believing you may have life in his name. Miracles then, including the miracles that we read in the Christmas story, are signs. That's what they are. They're signs. Signs that are meant to get our attention and to point us to God so that we will believe in Jesus and have life in his name. But the question still remains. Can God really do that stuff? 
I mean, seriously, can God do the stuff that we read about in the Bible? The Red Sea? Virgin birth? Resurrection? Can he do? Well, let me put it like this. You know, if we believe that there is a God who brought creation into being, or even if we're, we're open-minded enough to allow for the possibility that there might be a God who brought creation into being, wouldn't it be kind of silly for us to quibble, quibble over the relatively little miracles, like turning water into wine or giving sight to a blind man? I mean, God turns water into wine every year. It's just when Jesus was here, he did it at a wedding. And why did he do that? Because it was extraordinary to get our attention and to point us to God. In that miracle book I was talking about earlier, Eric, Eric Metaxas writes, believing that God could create the universe but couldn't perform any infinitely smaller miracle is illogical. There's a Spock word for you. Um, he says it's very much like saying, oh yeah, uh, of course, I certainly believe that Tolstoy could write War and Peace, and that he did, but I could never believe that he'd be able to move a comma in the manuscript. That'd be too much. If God actually created this universe somehow, can, can we not believe that he could, he'd be able to do almost anything else in it? It seems we would have to. I mean, if God could speak the universe into existence, couldn't he afterwards speak into that existence? This is what he did at Christmas. Now, let me say this. Just because God can work miracles, I'm sort of glad that he doesn't all of the time. And if you think about it, you probably are too. And here's why. Let me put it another way. I am glad that we live in a mostly orderly and predictable universe. Because it would be really a, a confusing mess if we didn't. If, if God never obeyed the, the laws of physics that he put into place because he was always doing miracles, and he answered every single prayer, you all would be parking or praying for the parking space right next to Macy's. And I don't know who would end up with it. It would be a confusing mess. And if, if, if the universe were not orderly and predictable mostly, uh, it's doubtful that life could even exist. But thank God that God sometimes, that God sometimes speaks into his creation in miraculous ways because it reminds us that God can do what to us, seems impossible. And he does. And here's where I think this whole message on miracles and the miracle of Christmas um, really impacts those of us in this room, as if the birth of Christ uh, were not enough. There are going to be times in our lives, and there may be a time in your life right now, this may be a time in your life when you're facing something that just seems like an impossible situation. It could be a relationship problem or a marriage problem or a health problem. Um, it could be struggling with emotional stuff. Um, that, that is when, when we're going through this kind of situation where we are facing what seems to us to be an impossible situation, that's when we need to remember something that Jesus said. That with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. There are things in life, and there are people in life that we, we might feel like giving up on because it seems like an impossible situation to us. It's not impossible for God. The truth is, this is the greatest miracle of all. 
This is the miracle that explains the creation, the miracle that prompted all of the Old Testament prophecies, the miracle that gives meaning to the virgin birth, the miracle to which Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead were pointing. This is the big miracle. You ready for it? The miracle of God's love for us, for poor, ornery sinners like the old Christmas song goes. Poor, ornery sinners like you and like me. That God loves us. In one of his essays, C.S. Lewis observed that, that you can take out the miracles from other world religions and not really change them. Nothing essential is going to be lost from Buddhism if you take the miracles that are attributed to Buddha out of the picture. But you cannot possibly do that with Christianity, he said, because the Christian story is precisely the story of one grand miracle. That what is beyond all space and time, what is uncreated and eternal, came into nature, came into human nature, descended into our, his own universe, and rose again, bringing up nature with him. It is precisely one great miracle. And if you take that away, there is nothing left. Nothing specifically Christian left. All the other miracles that we read about in the Bible either prepare for or exhibit or result from the incarnation. The Word made flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. So thank God for miracles. Thank God for miracles, for the miracle of creation, for the miracle of life. If you guys study science, I'm one of these people that just does not believe that science and, and the Christian faith are in opposition to one another. The more I learn of science and the more I learn about Jesus, the more I believe in God. I thank God for the miracle of creation. I thank God for the miracle of life. And it is a miracle. For the, I thank God for the biblical miracles. Thank God for the, the miracles God wants to work in your life. And will. God works miracles in people's lives today, but he's looking for people who are willing to welcome them. Thank God for the miracles God wants to work in your life if you are open-minded enough to look at the evidence and to believe that there is a God who came to earth, came to the creation that, that he fashioned so that he could work miracles in our lives. Miracles rooted in his love for each and every one of us.